Okay, welcome everyone. Let's kick this event off. So, firstly, you're all very welcome to Science Gallery Dublin for this event, which is highly anticipated. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's an event in line with uh, our current exhibition, Life at the Edges, which uh, explores life in extreme conditions. And from the depths of the ocean to outer space and how that exploration excites our mind and desire to explore. Uh, if you haven't been, go. If you have been, go again. It's open until September 30th. So tonight's event is, in, is titled, What is Space? A Light Year Away in Under an Hour Flat with Jim Baggett. Now Jim is uh, uh, an award-winning popular science writer and author with over 20 years experience uh, writing on topics in the physical, chemical and biological scientists, science. He trained as a scientist and studied and completed a, a doctorate in chemical physics at the University of Oxford uh, in the early 1980s, that's being kind to you, before embarking on postdoctoral research studies at Oxford and at Stanford University in California. So a big thanks to Jim for joining us and a thanks to the Oxford University Press for supporting this talk. So his talk will be followed by a Q&A, so if you've got questions, uh, we'll do that at the end and we'll have a mic going around, so just make sure that you speak into the mic so everyone on the live stream at home can hear you. Before we start, we're just going to mention some safety uh, aspects as well. So the safety exits are the doors you came in at the back behind you and this one on my left right here. So, where do we come from and how did we evolve? What is the universe and how did it form? What is the nature of the material world? And what is it like to be a material girl living in a material world? <laughs> Thank you. I didn't write that. <laughs> what is life? It doesn't finish there. What is life? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. I'm going there. I am going there. What is the universe? How big is it? Where's all the mass? Where does the mass come from? When's the last time you were at mass? But there are so many questions about space, but there's one that keeps me awake at night, and it's the fact that we live on a planet just the perfect distance from the sun. It's not too hot, not too cold, not too cheap to rent a gaff. <laughs> it's not, it's not. Have you seen rent? <laughs> and it's got all the elements we need to survive. There's hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon everywhere, nitrogen all through the air. There's oxygen so we can breathe, fluorine for our pretty teeth, neon to light up the signs, signs and sodium for salty times. Come on, I, I, I thought of that. That was good, that was good. good. It continued, but I, I, there's too many elements. <laughs> okay. all right. In a solar system with seven planets, sorry Pluto, in a galaxy with over 100 million stars, 100 million stars, that's outrageous. In an observable universe more than 100 billion light years across with trillions of galaxies in a possible multiverse of infinite universes. But how? How does Brian Cox get his hair so silky smooth? <laughs> Some things we'll just never know. So what is space? A light year away and under an hour flat. I've waffled for a bit too long, so if you can do it in 59 minutes, You'd be helping us all out. So, guys, please welcome Jim Baggett. Thanks very much, Mark, for that kind introduction. So, I thought Thursday was the new Friday. What are you all doing in here for an evening of physics? Hard sums. Okay, you may now turn over your papers. Uh, no, that's the wrong. Okay, so I, 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 I could go on and talk about everything that, that Mark has kind of paraphrased for me, uh, but we'd be here for probably two or three days. So I've decided this evening I'm going to limit myself to just address the issue of what is space. Okay? Keep it simple. And it seems, you know, that's not going to be a very difficult question to answer. We ought to be able to do it in about 10 minutes and then we can go grab a beer in the bar afterwards. I, I love this picture by the way. Those of you who remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind will remember the Devil's Tower. But there's a great night sky here which gives us some sense of the vastness 
of space that we're going to be talking about this evening. So what is space? That's me. Um, as Mark said, I have a background in science, but I've worked in the corporate world for a good many years. Um, uh, last time I was in Dublin was 25 years ago, visiting textile mills, I recall. I um, don't know whether there are any of those still left. I hope so. Um, but um, uh, I never uh, lost my passion for science and for trying to explain um, in as uh, an easy way uh, I can for people to follow who don't have a scientific background uh, just exactly what it is that we've discovered. Um, and it's an extraordinary story as I hope you'll begin to understand. So I'm going to start with a really simple and straightforward question. Where are you in space? Yeah. Now, Gaetan's going to help me out here. He's going to stand at the back there. And we're going to create a situation here where we have two points in space. Now, here we are in this wonderful theatre. And to answer that kind of question, where is he in space? Where am I in space? Where are you in space? We're actually going to uh, put a coordinate system around the theatre. Uh, very simple. We'll have X, Y, Z coordinates if you're British, Z coordinates if you're American. And we're going to read off. You know, I'm here, this particular point, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Gaton is up there with another set of X, Y, and Z coordinates. And we can draw the line between the two of us and establish where we are in space. OK, good. I'm finished. Thank you very much. <laughs> but hang on. Where is this place? Well, this place, of course, is in the science gallery. So we just expand our coordinate system a little bit. We make the box a bit bigger so we can now get the whole of the science gallery inside it. And we can do the same kinds of things. I can tell where Gaetan is. I can tell you where I am. I can tell you where you are. Ah, but where is the science gallery? In the fair city of Dublin. Oh, we make the coordinate system a bit bigger still so that we can now locate ourselves in the context of the city. We get to know where he is in space, where I, and, and you know, you get the picture. And you know, of course, we can keep going on like this. Where is Dublin in space? It's in Ireland. Where is Ireland? In Europe. I like this picture. Nothing Jacob Rees-Mogg can do will change the geographical fact of the location of Britain to the rest of Europe. <laughs> Come what he may try to do. And where is Europe? It's a continent on planet Earth. Oh, we just keep making our box bigger so we can get the coordinates now of Earth and we can locate Gaton and me and you in space on Earth. We might want to use a different coordinate system, maybe GPS now might be a good way of doing it. But Earth is the third rock from the Sun. Uh, the Sun is a typical G2 type star, one of between 100 and 200 billion in the Milky Way galaxy. You probably can't see it, but there's a little arrow saying Earth, <laughs> pointing to where the Earth is in the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is actually part of something called the local group, a small cluster of other galaxies, including the Andromeda galaxy. We just keep making our coordinate system bigger and bigger and bigger. But you know where this is going. Eventually, we're going to get the whole universe. And somewhere, you are here in space. But we still have our coordinate system. Now, this was fine. This is school physics, so-called Newtonian physics. Newton, in his mathematical principles, um, wrote uh, some wonderful, or deduced some wonderful laws of motion and a law of universal gravitation. And those laws are based on the assumption that there is such a thing as absolute space and absolute time. So if this is absolute space in which we can locate the universe, then all we need is a cosmic metronome to keep absolute time. I can't help but think of a 1970s progressive rock band when I say cosmic metronome. <laughs> it goes to show you how old I am. Um, and, and everything's fine, except that this doesn't feel right, does it? No, how can there be anything outside the universe? It's a little bit like a God's eye view 
uh, something outside the universe that has this coordinate framework, whatever, however we want to describe it, with this metronome keeping time. Um, it, it's, it's not any longer physics. Uh, Newton was accused of introducing all sorts of heretical elements into physics because of his insistence on the need for absolute space, time, and motion. And he couldn't explain his universal law of gravitation because it seemed to act instantaneously. So the moon sweeps around the Earth, um, trapped in Earth's gravity, but, but with apparently nothing passing between the two. It's rather mystical. He was accused of introducing occult forces into his physics. Now, generally speaking, physicists don't like occult forces. We use them from time to time when we have to. Uh, much of string theory is built that way. But uh, nevertheless, um, in effect, this, this doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. And of course, the person that uh, understood that it didn't feel right was Einstein. You know where this is going. It's going to Einstein's theories of relativity. Relativity seems like really quite an obscure theory, but I think it's really easy to understand. You just have to re remove completely this idea that there is something outside the entire universe, and you have to make sure you have a way of describing the physics going on inside the universe within coordinate systems or so-called frames of reference that are defined only in the universe itself. Now, Einstein, in 1905, introduced his special theory of relativity by uh, effectively uh, producing two postulates. He's a very democratic kind of guy and he insisted that the laws of physics really should be the same for everyone, rich or poor. And because we only have relative space, Gaetan at the back there has a position relative to me or the corner of this lecture theatre. We always need to reference positions in space, motions in space, momentum in space, against some kind of coordinate system, and these coordinate systems can and are arbitrary. That was the whole point. If you don't assume that, then the laws of physics can't be the same for everyone. If I'm moving in a certain way, I might experience physics in a way that someone standing still will not, and that's not right. Um, fans of Lord of the Rings? Anyone in the room? Fans? A few, a few. Now, I'm a fan of the book. I have read it about 20 times. I love the films. They were a really great attempt by Peter Jackson to carry what was a very, very complex story with lots of stuff going on into three very, very entertaining movies. And there's a, a moment uh, illustrated here by this picture from John Howe, uh, who worked as an illustrator for um, the Lord of the Rings fran film franchise. Uh, where uh, Gandalf um, dashes from Edoras to Minas Tirith, bearing Pippin in front of him on the back of Shadowfax, his white and trusty horse. And relativity um, is summed up by a passage from Lord of the Rings, uh, in fact, the two towers. Um, and, and that's Pippin fell slowly into sleep. He had a strange feeling. He and Gandalf were still as stone seated upon the statue of a running horse while the world rolled away beneath his feet with the great noise of wind. That's what relativity is. When you have truly a, a relativistic situation, you can't tell who is moving. Gaten might rush down the stairs towards me um, and you'd say, well, that's obvious what's happening in terms of the physics because he's running down the stairs. But maybe he stood still and the stairs are rushing up away from him away from me. In a truly relativistic universe, you can't tell who is doing the moving. That's the big secret, and that's the only way to make sure that the laws of physics are the same for anyone, everyone. The other principle that he introduced is the fact that the speed of light, there was evidence to suggest that the speed of light is finite and constant. So when I throw a ball on a moving train, I know that the speed of that ball through the air is the speed that I've thrown it at plus the speed of the moving train. Velocities are additive, but not for light. If I turn on a torch and light shines ahead in a darkened carriage, let's say, then the speed of that light is not affected by how fast the train is moving. 
the velocities aren't additive. We can have a big debate about why the speed of light is finite and constant, uh, but that takes us a bit off topic. But Einstein didn't have an answer for why, he just assumed it to be true. Now, one of the assumptions, one of the consequences of assuming that the speed of light is finite and constant is illustrated by what I'm about to show you next. Imagine a remarkable situation where you're out in the field somewhere and you see a remarkable occurrence. You see in a heavy thunderstorm two bolts of lightning strike simultaneously. That's you. Okay? Two bolts of lightning strike simultaneously and, and you perceive them, light travels from these bolts of lightning towards you at a fixed speed and you have no issue with saying, hey, they both happened at the same time. But me, I've figured out how I can move behind you at substantially the speed of light and I see something different. That's me. Now I think you can see because light takes a finite time, even though it's very, very fast, to come from the bolts of lightning towards me, because I'm rushing so fast towards one of the bolts, the light requires a shorter distance to cover. The other bolt requires a longer distance to cover. The consequence of that is, for me, these bolts are not simultaneous any longer. I see the right-hand bolt strike first and the left-hand bolt strike afterwards. And you might say, okay, well, you know, but one of, one of you is right. No. The laws of physics are the same for everyone. What this means is there can be no such thing as absolute simultaneity. There are different frames of reference where something will be simultaneous, but there'll be a frame of reference, perhaps a moving frame of reference, where things will not be simultaneous. And there is no right frame of reference because that just takes us back to absolute space and time. Okay? Um, if there's no absolute simultaneity, there is no absolute time. And the result of this is um, indeed Einstein's special theory of relativity, 1905. Um, as a consequence of assuming a fixed speed for light, uh, we end up with time dilating, space contracting, and energy and mass being equivalent. And we know one of the consequences of that. That, by the way, is uh, uh, not an atom bomb, it's a hydrogen bomb called a Tsar bomber. Uh, 500 megatons of TNT equivalent. Uh, it was a Soviet project. I can't tell you exactly when the explosion was filmed. But you get the idea. All of that from assuming the laws of physics must be the same for everyone and the speed of light is fixed and constant, uh, is um, constant but finite. Isn't that incredible? Time dilates, space contracts, and energy and mass are equivalent. One can be converted into the other. But he wasn't quite done yet. Uh, there's a reason why special relativity is called special relativity. That is because it doesn't handle acceleration. When Gandalf and Pippin are riding on the back of Shadowfax, they're moving at a uniform speed. And the illusion that Pippin describes in Tolkien's book is the illusion of not being able to tell what is moving. And that will only happen when you're moving at a uniform speed velocity. Anyone who's ridden a roller coaster or even just spun around in a park roundabout will know that you feel acceleration. Any kind of rotational motion by definition is acceleration and you feel it. So there's no fooling yourself into not being clear on who is moving relative to who. You feel that you are accelerating and you can't deny that experience. The other thing that special relativity can't do is it can't take account of gravity. But you know that's okay, there seem to be two problems here, but you know there are only one. And in 1907, while still working at the patent office in Bern, Einstein had what he argued later was his happiest thought. Ah. 
I was sitting in a chair in my paint office at Burns. Suddenly a thought struck me. If a man falls freely, he would not feel his weight. Ah! Do you want to see that again? If a man falls freely, he will not feel his weight. Now, um, there's a, in effect, an equivalence. This is what Einstein got from this, this flash of inspiration one day sitting in his office. I wish inspiration would come to me when I'm sitting at my desk. Nobel Prize, here I come. But alas, no. Um, this means, for example, that if I have a guy on an accelerating rocket ship, imagine it's just lifted off, it's now out, but it's, it's still accelerating, it's not any longer moving at uniform velocity. Um, and I also have planet Earth. Uh, it means that the feeling of falling, the sense of acceleration in the moving rocket ship and falling in the gravity of planet Earth are equivalent. No screams this time. Okay? And one of the consequences of that is the general theory of relativity. This is about 1970, uh, 1915. Notice that he had his moment of inspiration in 1907, and yet it took him another eight years to figure out how to turn that inspiration into a, a theory of relativity. And he, he made some mistakes. People think Einstein was a genius, and he was, but he was a genius in physics. He wasn't really that good at mathematics. And he made a couple of false, he made a couple of errors that led him off in false directions um, in that eight years. So it took him a long time uh, to get to where he ultimately got to, which is an extraordinary structure that we call general relativity. Now, uh, we all know what that looks like. You've seen lots of pictures of it. It means that space is, is we, we think of it as flat. We, again, this coordinate system, we can't get it out of our heads. X, Y, Z. Gaton is up at the back there. I'm here. We measure the distance. So intuitive. But the idea is based on the notion that space is flat. And Einstein realized the only way he could make acceleration and gravity equivalent is to allow it to curve. And this is how it works. You have a mass like the mass of the Earth distorting the space-time geometry around it. Now, when that guy falls through the atmosphere, drawn by the Earth's gravity towards the ground, eek, um, he's not affected by a force as such. He's slipping down the curvature of space-time is the right way to think about it. There is no such thing as the force of gravity. Whenever you're struggling to get out of bed in the morning, as I know I do, you're fighting not against gravity, you're fighting against the curvature of space-time and the mass. I happen to be carrying rather more of it in places where I shouldn't. So, at a stroke, he eliminated this occult force which draws the moon to the Earth and holds the Earth in place in the solar system, holds the Milky Way galaxy in the local group uh, of, of, gal of, uh, of galaxies. Um, and um, it, this was summed up by a great phrase by an American physicist called John Wheeler. Um, space-time tells matter how to move, but matter tells space-time how to curve. So there's a kind of symbiosis here. Wherever we have mass, we have curvature, and where we have curvature, we have the possibility of motion, of gravity. Now, you want to know what Earth's gravitational field is? It's the space-time around the Earth. That's, I wouldn't say that's all there is to it, but it's already pretty complicated. We get some other things besides. We get um, gravitational time dilation. We get um, gravitational redshift. I won't go into the details, but if light is traveling from the moon and comes towards the Earth because it's encountering a gravitational field, a curvature of space-time, uh, the light uh, frequency is changed slightly. It's redshifted. Um, we get black holes. We like black holes. And we get these things called gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time, caused, as they've been detected back in 2015, by this American LIGO experiment, 
uh, caused by two black holes merging. That's a pretty cataclysmic event in the universe. And that causes uh, ripples to emanate uh, from that moment of merger, uh, which we can then detect in an exquisitely subtle experiment. Um, anybody you here use uh, Google Maps to find this place? I see some people nodding. Yeah, good. Did it work for you? I sometimes get asked, I oh, know, Jim, but this is all fascinating stuff, but what, what use is it? You know, what, uh, general relativity. Is that, what do we use that for? Well, here's a thought. If we didn't put in corrections, calculated using general relativity and special relativity, then your GPS coordinates would accumulate errors at the rate of 11 kilometers a day. And that would put you anywhere in that circle. So good luck finding the Science Gallery in Dublin. Hope you don't end up here in the sea. Okay? Now, in 1917, Einstein went further. He got this theory of general relativity which allowed him to think about the interaction between matter with mass and space-time. And, and he figured, Do you know, I can apply this theory to the entire universe. Now, theories of the entire universe are generally, um, generally referred to as physical cosmology. So effectively what Einstein was doing is taking his first steps into a cosmological theory of the universe. We've been speculating on the nature of the universe ever since the ancient Greeks, but here was a scientific theory which already had gathered some evidence, by the way, quite a lot of evidence. And here was Einstein now applying it to the universe as a whole. Now he had to, uh, you know, he had to um, assume a few things. He had to assume that the universe is uniform in all directions. Okay, well, maybe not such a big assumption. He had to assume that we're not in a specially privileged position in the universe. We see a fair sample when we look around. And we have to, or he had to assume that the universe is finite, but it has no edges. Anybody like to suggest an object that is at the same time finite, but has no edge? A sphere? Hey, very good. Now, planet Earth is finite. I forget now the mass of the Earth, but it's limited. You know, it has a, it's a number I can quote. Uh, and it has no edges. We, we learned that ever since we let go of the notion, unless you're a conspiracy theorist, that the Earth is flat. So it, is no, it has no edges. It's called a two-sphere. That's mathematicians for you. It's a sphere in three dimensions. And they call a sphere in three dimensions a two-sphere. So Einstein was now dealing with a sphere in... Three dimension, uh, four dimensions, in effect, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Um, and that's what it looks like. That's a three sphere projected onto two dimensions. Don't, don't, it'll make your head hurt <laughs> if you study that for too long. Of course, it's a very abstract construction, but perfectly reasonable from a mathematical point of view. Uh, a three sphere is a sphere in, in fact, if you're familiar with Dante's Inferno, Dante uses the notion of a three sphere to explain one of the levels of hell. Who knew? Okay. Now, uh, Einstein was very much concerned to make sure that the universe his equations were describing was static. There are all sorts of reasons why he felt this was important. Um, and I don't propose to go into them now, but um, what he found, of course, was that when you fill a universe with, with matter, it, 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 it tends to suck everything in. That you end up with a collapsing universe. And there is no evidence that the universe is collapsing. So he wanted, he felt it was important to modify his equations a little bit. Give them a little tweak. That's why I've drawn a picture of fudge. So he fudged the equations. He introduced something called the cosmological constant. Decide, designed to hold everything back. Stop everything from collapsing. But the cosmological constant will come back to haunt us, as we'll see. It was soon realized that we didn't need it. We could quite happily explain uh, the universe without it. And in any case, by the 1930s, evidence was starting to accumulate that the universe is actually expanding. Now again, all sorts of different ways of thinking about this. But if we, 
imagine for a minute, assume, hypothesize, that the universe with its Milky Way sat there is, again, has a uniform distribution of galaxies like the Milky Way all around us. And we imagine that the space between these galaxies is expanding. And we let it expand for a little time, but we stay focused on the Milky Way because that's where we're looking at the rest of the universe from. We can't change that. What you'll see is, after a short time, all the galaxies have moved a little bit further apart. We've stayed still because that's where we are observing all this motion. And what you notice is that the further away the galaxy, the further it seems to have gone, even though space has just been stretched at a uniform amount. And that's interesting because when we start to look at the redshift of light coming from these distant galaxies, we see that they suggest that the galaxies are receding from us at a rate which is directly proportional to their distance from us. Now, they're not actually receding. The, the, the galaxies themselves aren't moving. They might be moving within, the Milky Way is moving within the local group. This is something different. This is space expanding, carrying the galaxies along with the expansion. And the further away they are, the faster they seem to be receding from us. And this is Hubble's law, and that's Edwin Hubble smoking a pipe. All right, so look what's happened by choosing to reject the idea of absolute space and time. A lot. Everything becomes relative. Motion is relative. Space, positions in space are relative. Velocities are relative. There are frames of reference. We can choose any frame of reference within the universe we like, but there is no frame of reference outside the universe. There's no God's eye view. That consequence leads us to time dilating, space contracting, E equals mc squared, pushing it a little bit further, building in the theory to allow for acceleration and gravity. We discover that they're actually equivalent. It's the same thing. Space-time curves in the presence of matter. So gravity is simply the curvature of space-time. We, we simply slip down that curve whenever we fall, pulled by gravity as we experience it. Apply it to the whole universe. We get this theory that we now see evidence suggesting that the universe is expanding. That can be quickly built into Einstein's field equations of general relativity. And we're now beginning to have a description, a theoretical description, of things going on in the entire universe. Isn't that absolutely incredible? Yes, I think so. Now, there's one other thing, if we're going to get a complete picture here. Um, in addition to measuring the redshift of distant galaxies and calculating their recession velocities and working out Hubble's law and all those good things, um, astronomers, being astronomers, like to you know, do whatever they can. And, and um, actually beginning in the 1930s, but very much uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, um, astronomers have observed the rotation of galaxies. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's our nearest neighbor in terms of an entire galaxy. Again, probably about 100 billion, 200 billion stars or thereabouts, um, and lots of gas and, and no doubt planetary systems, uh, maybe some like Earth, who knows. Um, and you, you can monitor the, or measure the speed of rotation of the entire galaxy by looking at the speeds of rotation of individual stars further and further out from the galactic center. One slight problem is you can do the calculation for how fast the star should be rotating around the galaxy just using Newton's physics. You don't need general relativity for this. And when you do that, what you get doesn't match up with what you measure. We love this kind of thing in science, don't we? Oh, goodness me. So that's calculated quite Obviously, the further the star is out from the center, the slower it should be rotating because it doesn't, it's not feeling the effects of gravity or the curvature of space-time quite so much as stars right close to the center. But that's not what we see. We see the curve flattening off. 
These stars out on the outer edge of the galaxy are moving around the center far faster than they ought to be. The only explanation for that so far that's been dreamt up is this notion of dark matter. So embedded, the galaxy is embedded in a halo of dark matter. This is really mysterious stuff. It's not ordinary matter that you and I and everyone else in this room is made of. It's not protons and neutrons and electrons. It's some form of matter, it's believed, that only experiences gravity and something called the weak nuclear force. That's why it's called dark matter. Whenever you hear the phrase dark, it means physicists don't know what the hell is going on. We're going to have another dark thing in a minute. All right, so, okay, so we've got dark matter. We've got ordinary matter, and we've got space and time. All the ingredients you need to describe what's going on in the universe. So, here's a brief history of what we know. You've seen pictures like this before. Um, we see uh, what this, this curve is meant to represent is each, each hoop is a, is, a, is a marker for a billion years. We begin in the corner, in the far uh, left with the Big Bang. That's this bright thing. It wasn't bright. It didn't look like this, but don't worry about that. Um, notice how to get this kind of tuba shape, um, the universe has to undergo very, very rapid expansion. It's called cosmic inflation. It's very contentious right now in, in theoretical physics as to whether this really happened or not, or whether there's another explanation for the accelerated expansion of the universe. But accelerate it did, for whatever reason. Uh, we've then got something called recombination, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, it's effectively um, hydrogen and helium nuclei combining not recombining, it's called recombination, but they've never combined ever before in the history of the universe, so. But recombination. Electrons fastening onto these nuclei to produce neutral atoms. Um, then we've got something called the Dark Ages. Remember, as the universe expands, it cools. Back at the time of recombination, the universe would have been about 3,000 Kelvin. Now, Kelvin, just think degrees centigrade, add 273 to get Kelvin. And in all the time it's continued to expand, the universe has cooled. In fact, the universe, although you might be reasonably warm in this lecture theatre this evening, uh, in truth, if I were to take a uh, global measure, the universe, the temperature of the universe is a little bit under 3 Kelvin, close to absolute zero on the temperature scale. Um, I don't quite agree with this picture. I think the first stars and galaxies appeared a little earlier than this, but it really doesn't matter. After the Dark Ages, we start to see the first stars form, the first galaxies form. The universe continues to expand. We have to wait a little while. Stars form, stars die. They're reborn, they die again. They re they're reborn again. Um, and. Uh, notice how you get this tuber shape. After about five billion years or five billion years ago, um, the, the curvature starts to become more noticeable. And that is because the universe is undergoing accelerated expansion. The idea was you have the Big Bang and it expands, but it expands at a uniform rate. And as a result, um, uh, again, I, I don't have time, unfortunately, to tell you the details, but observations of a certain type of supernova in very, very distant galaxies, it was discovered that, in fact, the universe, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Only one real explanation. Einstein's cosmological constant is back in the picture, doing something a little bit different than it was doing when Einstein introduced it in 1917, but it's nevertheless back there. And again, because we don't know what the hell is going on, we call it dark energy. It's the energy of empty space. Physicists love to say that. They sound like high priests. Yes, yeah, the energy of empty space. <laughs> Means they don't know what the hell is going on. Um, about four and a half billion years ago, we start to see our star forming. 
but now surrounded by a, ga a cloud of gas and dust. That dust coagulates, accretes to produce a planetary system, a solar system. Um, there is a reason why in the outer reaches of the solar system we have gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn and ice giants like Neptune and I'm 61, I call it Uranus. Get used to it. And, but the inner planets are the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And that's simply a gravitational effect. Gas gets hurled away from the sun, uh, rock gets pulled in towards the center. And you end up with a balance. Okay, um, we appear right at the very edge and then develop civilization, language, communication, physics. And we end up drawing pictures like this, pondering on our own existence and the existence of the universe that we live in. Now, the whole history of the universe then stretches some 13.8 billion years. Billion being a thousand million. So the universe has been around a long time. We've been around like a dot in that time. Uh, literally, if this was 24 hours, we appear some thousandths of a second before midnight. Okay? So here's a quick overview. I just want to cover the first few stages in this description, just to give you a little bit more insight on what was going on. And I want to touch on a little bit the evidence that we have for thinking that this picture, this short history I've given you, is correct. So we start with the Big Bang. That was what the noise was. Now, the, the universe is believed. Again, we can only extrapolate our theories into domains where they're no longer applicable and hope for the best. But this scale here, which you may not be able to read at the back, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's called a Planck scale or a Planck distance. Now, I can't really give you a feel for how big that is, but a proton has a diameter of about 10 to the minus 18 meters, what's known as an atometer, thereabouts. So we're talking what's that, 15 orders of magnitude smaller than a proton? Kind of gives you some idea of what the Planck scale is all about. Who knows what's going on here? One thing we do know, that at that kind of scale, when the universe is that big, it's going to be quantum in nature. Now, quantum mechanics is a whole nother lecture. Uh, and all I want to tell you about quantum mechanics at this stage is that it's bizarre and it means as a result of something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle stuff fluctuates in a way that we're just not used to from the kind of scale on which we study physics in the laboratory and that fluctuation I've represented with this little picture here so it, it's it's jittery Think of the universe having a real bad case of the jitters. Too many pints of Guinness the night before. Okay, so you've woken up with a heck of a bit of a hangover. Um, now, if you believe cosmic inflation, then this is kind of what happens. But notice that jitteriness carries through. It leaves an imprint as the universe expands very, very rapidly during cosmic inflation. It, this is really going on at a very, very early stage in the birth of the universe. Then that, that jitteriness has an effect. It leads to what's known as inhomogeneities. Things aren't exactly uniform across the universe. And that will come back to bite us, as we'll see in a bit. I like to think this is a cosmic thumbprint left at a, a bloody thumbprint left at a cosmic crime scene, this jitteriness. Um, now, about uh, somewhere between a trillionth of a second and a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, um, we have a universe filled with quarks, so far as we can tell. Um, I'm just focusing here on up and down quarks. That's what the different colors are. They come in different colors of red, green, and blue. Um, and free electrons. And in this period, called the quark epoch, 
um, over time, individual quarks are very unhappy. Very unhappy. That they, they need chaperoning. Um, and, and so, over time, they, they gather together in groups of three. Um, uh, two up quarks and a down quark make a proton. Uh, two down quarks and an up quark make a neutron. Uh, we move on to something called primordial nucleosynthesis. So this happened about, think, about a second after the Big Bang, as far as we can tell. Um, the protons and neutrons gather together. Two neutrons and two protons form a nucleus of helium. And a single proton is enough to form a nucleus of hydrogen. Now, these are positively charged nuclei. And there are free electrons. So, in effect, what happens is that you've got electromagnetic radiation light bouncing back and forth between these. And this creates for a very um, foggy environment. Think of this as like the mother of all thunderstorms. About a second after the Big Bang or thereabouts. So we, we can't tell what's going on in here. The universe is opaque. It's like blundering around in a, in a dense fog. But all this time the universe is expanding and it's cooling. And as it cools, things start to settle down. We get to the stage where it's possible now for those free electrons to latch on to the nuclei to form neutral helium and hydrogen atoms. And that's called recombination. It's the first time they've ever combined, but never mind. That's what the physicists call them. And do you remember our bloody thumbprint? Those quantum fluctuations right from the very beginning of everything are still imprinted on the universe at the time of recombination. And it means that when that radiation is released, when it stopped bouncing back and forth between these nuclei and the electrons, and the electrons combine with the nuclei, the light has nowhere else to go. It's set free. If we want to be biblical, we could say, let there be light. Because there was light. In fact, there was visible light at this time. The temperature of the universe is about 3,000 Kelvin, as I mentioned. And that temperature variation, the fact that the material in the universe is not uniformly distributed, but is inhomogeneous, is imprinted on something called the cosmic microwave background, which is now the cool radiation left over after this moment of recombination. Recombination happened about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, but it's still with us, and it's in, now in the form, because it's cooled, its temperature and its frequency has shifted to the microwave region. It was visible, but now it's invisible. It's microwave radiation and infrared radiation. But we can detect it. It was first detected in 1963, 1964, by Penzias and Wilson. Uh, when we measure this temperature variation, there's been several satellite uh, missions. Uh, put, uh, we put a satellite into orbit and they measure this cosmic microwave background and the temperature variation across the sky. Uh, first there was COBE, then there was something called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Our physicists are great with names. And then the Planck satellite. Um, this is a picture actually from the WMAP satellite. But when we map the fluctuations in temperature squared across the sky, uh, according to angular scale, we see this characteristic pattern. A big peak, two equal size peaks, and, uh, and then a, a trailing off. These are acoustic waves. This is the universe kind of with, with sound bursting through as, as, as the universe kind of vibrates, producing rarefaction and, and compression. Sorry, I did that in the opposite sense. Compression, rarefaction, you, you know what I'm saying. Very characteristic, it's, it can be described by simple theories of, well, complex theories of hydrodynamics. I like to think the universe was singing or screaming. Um, from an analysis of this cosmic microwave background radiation, we end up with uh, a picture like this. This is now the standard model of Big Bang cosmology. Um, we get this little pie chart here. Dark energy accounts for about 68% of the universe. It's a shame we don't know what it is. 
Dark matter accounts for about 27% of the entire universe. It's a pity we don't know what that is either. Baryonic matter, that's the stuff you and I are made of, the stuff the star, our sun is made of, planet Earth is made of, the thing we recognize in galaxies and everything else, is only 5% of the entire universe. The universe is mostly missing. That's just stunning. So physicists have a lot of work to do still. Um, the Dark Ages, we have some explanation for what was going on. So this is a period when we, the light's gone out, the universe has cooled and, and the light radiation, the frequencies have shifted uh, into uh, non-visible uh, uh, regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. But we, we think what would have happened is that all that dark matter, again, not uniformly distributed through the universe. Um, it still feels the effect of gravity. We don't know what it is, but we believe it experiences the effect of gravity. And, and it starts to coalesce. These uh, dark matter halos start to come together in what's known as a merger tree. Slowly drawing together. Now, each of these dark matter halos has a bit of ordinary matter stuck in the center. It's, it's heavier than dark matter, so it tends to be drawn into the center. And when there's enough ordinary matter, we turn on the lights again. We get the first stars and the first galaxies. And I thought at this stage I'd give you a little musical interlude. Are you ready? Sure. I want you to watch while we observe a galaxy a little bit like the Milky Way forming. Now, much speeded up, I should say. It's not in real time. If you've ever wondered why spiral galaxies are spiral, Again, it's simply because of the dynamics of this ordinary matter in the center of a dark matter halo um, coming together. All you need is a little bit of inhomogeneity. Things start to rotate. Uh, and again, just like that playground roundabout, um, uh, that rotation builds and builds as more and more matter is accumulated. And then galaxies collide with each other, uh, as, as often happens. You can see that kind of thing going on here. And this is a, obviously a computer simulation of what we think um, galaxy formation might look like. Enjoy that? Yeah. It's good, isn't it? So, now, Mark mentioned at the beginning he wanted to know how big the universe is. Men are often obsessed with size. And um, you might think, hang on, if the universe has been expanding for 13.8 billion years, then surely, um, the, the, the radius uh, of, of the universe must be that many light years. We know what a light year is? Um, a light year is the, dis uh, the, the distance that light travels in one year, uh, about nine and a half thousand billion kilometers, a bloody long way. Um, and 13.8 billion years of expansion, you'd think then the, the distant reaches, the edge, I don't know it's not really an edge, but you know what I mean. The, the boundary, the spherical boundary of the universe ought to be about 13.8 billion light years distant. But ah, the universe has been expanding in that 13.8 billion years. So in actual fact, there's a suggestion, in fact, that the size of the universe might be something more like 46 billion light years, the radius, which is where Mark gets the 100 billion years. So that's the diameter. So it's, I don't agree that it's 100, but it's not far off, twice 46. But there's a problem with that too, because we have no hope whatsoever of light ever getting from 46 billion light years away and reaching us on planet Earth. And that means that there's something called a cosmic event horizon, probably around about 16 billion light years or so. So we'll never see the whole universe. Uh, and because the universe, the, the expansion is accelerating, more and more of it 
will go out of, of reach. We'll, we'll no longer be able to see it. If we're around in another billion years' time, we'll be able to see less than we can see today. Okay, good. Well, what you really need to know is space is big. You might think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space, as the philosopher Douglas Adams told us many, many years ago. It's vast. Yeah, but I haven't really answered the question. What is space? Uh, it's that nothing that exists between material objects. There's nothing between me and Mark, and, and we call that the space between us. Well, if we want to dig more deeply into what space is, then actually what we need is something called the quantum theory of gravity. Remember, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that there's actually no such thing as the force of gravity, there's just the curvature of space time. We fall, slip along the curve, as it were, rather than get tugged by a force. And uh, that's fine. That means that gravity and space-time, the fabric of space-time, are kind of one and the same thing when we put matter in. But um, a quantum theory of gravity, then, is a quantum theory of space itself, a quantum theory of space and time. Now, uh, the problem is that current theories of gravity, quantum theories of gravity are very speculative and unproven. But there's one, happens to be my favourite, one candidate called loop quantum gravity, um, which predicts that space itself is quantum in nature. There are lumps of space, undividable, inherent quanta. A bit like saying there are lumps of light called photons. Um, now, uh, this is the brainchild of more than two guys, but they happen to be the principal architects of loop quantum gravity. You may have heard of both of these guys. Carlo Rovelli in particular is, is a million best-selling author. I'm not jealous at all. Uh, his books are out on sale, I noticed, in the bookshop. His most recent one is called The Order of Time. Uh, Carlo doesn't believe time exists. That's okay. Um, and Lee Smolin in himself is no slouch. Uh, he's published, again, some best-selling books. One back in 2000 called Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, explaining the different ways that we can take, the different routes we can take to create this structure. So imagine space as a kind of network with, with nodes and links. Um, very abstract. I don't anticipate for a minute you'll be able to really picture this in your mind. Uh, these nodes are where uh, we find the quanta of volume of space. And the links between them are where we find quanta of area. Uh, we recover time from the fluctuations of these nodes and links. Remember, this is quantum, so they, they fluctuate. They, they, they're uncertain. And as they fluctuate, they create this, this sense of time. The clock ticks only when the number of nodes in these pictures change, in this case, from one to three. Um, like I say, very speculative, very abstract. Um, are we ever likely to know whether it's right? or whether alternative approaches to quantum gravity, such as string theory, are right? Well, there is something called loop quantum cosmology. Just like Einstein applied the general theory of relativity to the entire universe, you can apply loop quantum gravity to the entire universe. What you get is very interesting. If you assume cosmic inflation, remember this picture with the universe screaming? The big peak and then the two equal peaks. If we focus on this extreme bit here at high angular scales, You'll notice, in fact, that conventional Big Bang cosmology predicts the upper curve. Notice also the points that come from measurements at, from the Planck satellite and the error bars associated with it. Loop quantum cosmology predicts the lower curve. It's extremely subtle, the difference. The rest is, of the curve is the same. So, we will have to wait and see until the sensitivity of our instrumentation is enough to get those error bars down, and then we'll know which curve is the right one. Watch this space. Give it about 40, 50 years. Then we might know. Right, that's me done. I hope I've given you a sense, right, from where are you in space 
through Einstein's special relativity, general relativity, cosmology, Big Bang theory, a description of the early stages of that Big Bang model, what it explains, how we get the evidence that we, gives us encouragement that we think we're on the right track in this description. Um, we've got then a very, very brief glimpse of what is space in terms of current theories of uh, quantum gravity. Very, very brief. Um, and, and don't forget, please, to exit through the gift shop. Um, much of what I've talked about is from a book I published about three years ago called Origins. Um, I published a book uh, last year called Mass, which effectively uh, I've not touched on at all today, but it's you want to know where mass comes from, what the Higgs boson does, all that kind of good stuff, and that's all in that book. Suffice to say, um, the equation that you want to go away with here is not E equals MC squared, it is M equals E over C squared. Mass is energy. There is no such thing as mass. Hmm. Um, and quantum space, uh, all about loop quantum gravity, is coming out this November. Okay, I'd like just to thank and acknowledge that beautiful uh, computer simulation of the formation of a Milky Way type galaxy comes from uh, Fabio Governato at the University of Washington. And these are all the scientists and the folks at Oxford University Press that helped put these three books together for me. And uh, obviously, thanks to you for your patience. Um, don't forget to follow me on Twitter. If we all followed me on Twitter, I'd be getting up to about 900 followers. That would be pretty impressive. So. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Cool, so we do have time for questions and answers, so if you have a question that keeps you awake at night, now is the time to ask it, so ask it now or forever hold your peace. But uh, if you have a question, please put your hands in the air and wait, we will get you a mic so everyone can hear you, including the people at home. So, uh, yeah, awesome, we got a hand up. And so, just wait for the mic, speak into the mic, nice and loud. Hey, um, you mentioned that like the expansion of the universe is the rate at which it's expanding is increasing. Yep. So basically, at what rate is it expanding and is it approaching the speed of light? I presume whenever it reaches the speed of light, then there's going to be some problems. Do you know, I mean, I, I, can, I can point to the answer. I can give you numbers uh, for the rate of expansion, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure they'd be very meaningful. When we talk about the expansion, what we mean really is the kind of distance between neighboring galaxies uh, increasing. Um, and, and you're right, to a certain extent. Um, I think, however, long before we get to an expansion rate that starts to get out of control like that, um, the universe will have become a very dark and pretty inhospitable place. It's what's known as the heat death of the universe. Um, if you think about it, everything is winding down. Entropy is increasing. Uh, we're starting to run out. The longer the universe expands, the less we are able to see of it. Uh, it, ratchet is ba it ratchets back. Um, and all the stars go out, we die, and, and, and basically it's a pretty soulless place. So when that happens, um, yeah, um, who knows what might be happening to the expansion rate at that, line, that time, because there'll be just space-time left and some bits and pieces of, of, uh, of, of, of quantum stuff. So it's not answering your question. There are numbers. Uh, I don't actually have the numbers right at the top of my head. Um, we know that the universe the expansion rate is increasing, though, again, because of this experiment with monitoring supernovae, which, which are, are great. They're like little candles in the dark. When a supernova happens, it lights up an entire galaxy, and, and obviously very, very distant galaxies, right at the far edge of what we can see in the visible universe. Uh, when a candle goes off like that, it's a great marker. Uh, and what, what was observed was that if you then start to put these into a, into a graph, basically, uh, they seem to be way more distant than they should be. So it means that the expansion must be accelerating. We think it flipped about five billion years ago. But it's, it's trundling. Um, don't, you won't wake up in the morning and Andromeda is now you know, another 10, year, 10 light years distant. It's very slow. Often the question comes up is, does that mean the space inside my body is expanding? No, not really. Um, if, it, if it was, you just wouldn't notice. But remember, things like physics, 
the, the distance between an electron and a proton in, in an atom, that's set by, by the physics, that's set by electromagnetic interactions between particles. Uh, it's not dependent on the distance. So even if the distance were to increase, the electron would still be the same distance uh, from, from the nucleus. So um, don't worry about your, well, I worry about expansion here, but that's a different kind of expansion. Don't worry about space and time expanding in your own body, because that's not what's happening. Okay? I did my best. Yep. Great. Hi, Jim. Thanks for being here. I, I'm wondering the uh, idea of slipping through this curve, yep. the, the expression of gravity. Um, in order to get something off the surface of this Earth, we certainly spend a great deal of energy yep. on a spacecraft, for example. Yep. And I'm considering the idea of something slipping, if you will, to easily remove itself from the surface and get out in the stratosphere and beyond. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Uh, just, but you put it exactly right. I mean, in effect, um, uh, you're, you're fighting against the gravitational pull. You need to exceed the so-called escape velocity to get a rocket up out beyond the pull of Earth's um, uh, gravitational field, but if you think of that gravitational field as just as the space-time around planet Earth, then yeah, what you're getting to is a, is a position in space-time where the curvature is no longer affecting. It's no longer causing that rocket to slide back towards the Earth. And, that, and that's, that's all there is. So, so again, we, we know this picture with the, 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 you know, the funnel and the Earth sitting in it. Um, there was a beautiful experiment. It suffered a, a, a blip, unfortunately, uh, called Gravity Probe B, which reported out about 2011, uh, which actually put a, a, a satellite into orbit to observe a couple of effects, including something called frame dragging. As the Earth rotates, it, it, it pulls space-time with it, and you can actually detect that. A couple of very highly sensitive um, uh, uh, pieces of equipment inside this uh, satellite were detecting the, the drag of space-time as the Earth rotates. Absolutely remarkable. So there's lots and lots of evidence to support this idea that space-time is curved. Yep. Question here. Okay. Up here. We'll get how to much, How much does the Earth weigh? A lot. I don't know the number off the top of my head, darling. So, uh, give me give me a minute, and I'll 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 Google it, and I'll tell you. <laughs> I could Google it right now, but I've left my phone up the back there. A lot. Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I do have the number somewhere. The, the number wasn't in the presentation, was it? It's it's m millions and millions of kilograms. But but I can give you a number. You're trying to calculate the extent of gravitational pull that you're experiencing, I've no doubt. Yes? Uh, you were saying at the beginning about how um, after the Big Bang that the universe was at 3,000 kelvins and it's now at about 3 kelvins. Yep. I was wondering not, not quite after the Big Bang, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, and we, we know it has to be roughly that time because we can use theories to assess how quickly the universe cooled. And it needs to be cool enough for recombination to happen. About 3,000 Kelvin, that's the temperature at which you start to rip electrons away from hydrogen atoms. So it needs to be at that temperature for, them, for you to get recombination. Yeah, about 3,000 Kelvin then, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and about just a little bit under 3K today. And is that constant? So is that continually going down? And what happens yeah. if it... Yeah, as, as, as space-time expands, the universe cools. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, again, it's, it's relatively uh, straightforward and simple physics. This guy really wants to ask a question. Can we do him first and then him? First thing an answer. Six by 10 to the 24 kilograms. Six by 10 to the 24 kilograms. <laughs> um, I think the answer to the first question of mine is simple enough by your book, because I'm all confused. Yes. Space is how we see the temporal change in these quanta. Time is how we see the spatial change in these quanta. It looks a little circular from where I'm standing, sitting, so I have to buy your book. What, yeah, what, one, of the, one, of the, one of the... No, it's, it's, I'm not sure you'll get the answer from the book. Um, maybe read Carlo Rovelli's book, see what he has to say. 
But one of the problems is when you create a, a quantum theory of gravity, you lose time. It, it's, just, it's, just, it's just one of those things. And, and so you're left with a dilemma of how you get time back. So again, being smart cookies, these guys figure that the that, that time must be what happens when stuff changes in space. Yeah, it changes, changes position. That's what I just said. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, that there's nothing, and that's exactly how it works, um, according to, to these guys. So again, you, you saw how it, time is, is, is introduced in loop quantum gravity as a result of the changing and shifting nodes of space. And the second question, instead of dark energy, why did they not use a perfectly good word that had fallen out of favor a little, but it was time to bring it back? Why didn't they call it the ether? They could have called it the ether. The unfortunate thing is that the ether back in um, kind of Victorian. Victorian physics, the time of James Clerk Maxwell, who was a big advocate of the ether, was, was, was meant to be quite a bit more tangible, actually. Um, this, this, uh, I, the, the energy density of empty space is very, 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 very low. So um, ether doesn't, doesn't quite cut it, and of course it's potentially confusing if you start to talk about the ether again after all these years. Last question. Can we end up in big, big crunch? A big crunch. Well, interestingly, um, I don't quite see how we can get a big crunch from where we are today, but we don't know everything. But interestingly, think about it. If there is such thing as an ultimate unit of space, a quantum of space, one of the things that that does, it avoids a problem in general relativity applied to the universe called a singularity. Um, a singularity is where things go infinite, and we don't like infinite. There's no such thing as infinite in nature. Okay, But if there's nothing smaller than the absolute unit or quantum of space, then there is no singularity. And there is uh, papers, I talk about it in uh, the new book, Quantum Space, um, that suggests, in fact, um, that the Big Bang wasn't the creation of something, but it was followed by the collapse of the universe that went before. So we had a big bounce because you can't get smaller than a quantum. So the idea is the universe before that went before collapsed on itself, hit the barrier, hit the bump uh, that is the ultimate quantum of space, and then bounced through the other side. Good luck proving that. <laughs> I, I, are you talking about bringing things... Yeah, to bring, I, I get, again, we, I, I, from what I understand about how we describe the universe at the moment, with the expansion accelerating, that looks like that's going to go on forever. And I don't quite see how you, you, you bring things back. But like I say, we don't know everything. Um, you know, theories can change quite quickly. Guys, we're going to have to wrap it up there. But uh, I'd just like to again thank Jim for joining us here this evening. And for, yeah. <laughs> It was a, an extremely interesting uh, and engaging talk that I'm sure we could stay here uh, all night and listen to you and I really enjoyed it. I was disappointed when you said there's nothing between us. I thought we'd, I thought we'd bonded over these few moments in space and time, but whatever. Um, just to, to reiterate that you can watch this again uh, if you, you didn't catch anything. Uh, it's live streamed on Facebook so you can click on and watch it again. And I also highly recommend uh, Jim's books which are on sale outside. They're um, absolutely fantastic. Again, you can find out more about tonight's talk and uh, many, many other things through them. They're just outside the door on the left, so check them out. And just as this century began with the certainties of absolute knowledge and ended with the absolute knowledge of uncertainty, much like tonight's talk, you can find out more by following Jim on Twitter. Check out his books. Watch the live stream. Thank you all for coming. Peace out. Thanks, guys. Thank